So uh, let's start with this question. Uh, what happened to the sacred in church architecture? That's a great question. How much time do you have? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, quickly thinking about that, because obviously I think it's something everybody wonders about. Um, There's so, unfortunately so many ugly churches in the world. So it, it, it was uh, unfortunately the perfect storm of, of different things coming together. It kind of begins after the Second World War, where you obviously have this devastation, right? And unfairly, the traditional architecture gets scapegoated as part of the problem, you know? And so there's this, there's this desire to kind of start over in the world of architecture from a clean slate and, you know, throw away everything in the past. So that's, that's one, one stream that was running through. Then, of course, is also this stream of the changes in the liturgy itself, right? Mm -hmm. So that the liturgy was in a state of flux, you know, in the, in the 60s. And so there was a lot of things that were in upheaval as well. And lastly, there was this desire in the church for relevance, right? And the thought was, let's do away with what we, have, we see as the trappings of tradition that is holding us back from reaching people. Now, as, as we can see, hindsight being 2020, that was, that was not the correct view. That was an incorrect view. <laughs> didn't work out, did it? It didn't work out very well. And so what, what's happening now is a rediscovery of tradition and seeing how rather than hindering us, mm -hmm. the identity that we have as Catholics is our strength. You know, that having a strong, clear identity, both in our architecture, but also in our liturgy, is much more effective at winning souls to Christ. Here's another question I asked yesterday when I was thinking about this interview. Is beauty in the eye of the beholder, or are there principles that uh, are at play that are true for all human persons? Yeah, that's another great question. So I think for a long time, you know, again, since probably about the 60s or so, people think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but, and, but no, actually the Catholic tradition and the Catholic understanding is that there is such a thing as objective beauty. And, uh, you know, it really comes from kind of the realist to mystic tradition of saying that something is beautiful, and to use big words here, something is beautiful when it reveals its full ontological reality, mm. which essentially is when it reveals its essence, right? It's so, thorness. That's right. Yeah. And so when is a church beautiful? Well, when it reveals churchliness or when it reveals the essence of the liturgy, right? And mm. so if, if it captures that, then it is beautiful. So, and, and that goes across the board, you know, when, when is a woman beautiful, when she is womanly, you know, when she is fully what she is, you know, and so that, that is the objective definition of beauty. It's interesting because St. Thomas actually never treated the topic of beauty. He kind of just great, uh, glosses over it. He, yeah, he it defines kind of in passing, right. In passing, he just defines beauty as that, which when seen pleases, yeah. uh, which really struck me because uh, we talked about this with our buddy, Dave Palmer in Dallas. And he's like, you know, it's interesting. Whenever Thomas doesn't comment on something that tells you something because he talked about everything, everything. Yeah. And so if he briefly just goes over beauty and just be, and just says that's which scene pleases, then it was expected that you kind of knew what beauty was intrinsically. Mm -hmm. You just recognized mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And so he didn't feel the need to go on further because mm. our taste, which, uh, you know, you know, there's a saying, you know, uh, there's no accounting for taste. Yeah. And so the, and so St. Thomas addresses this and is like, yeah, well, you, you see it and it's, it just makes you, it lifts your heart and mind to God. It pleases you. That's right. But now our tastes have been so distorted by reality. People like death metal music, they're like ugly yeah. architecture. Yeah. We've just been convinced, bombarded by this ugliness that we see something that's just like slightly less ugly. And we're like, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that element of it? Sure. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you have to be formed in beauty as well, right? So just like you have to form yourself in your faith, you have to form yourself in having, you know, in educating yourself as it regards to everything. You have to form yourself and your children in beauty. You have to expose them to beautiful things that, are, again, are objectively beautiful because they reveal something of God in the everyday. And so I think it's, it's important that we realize that in our culture today, a lot of things are being presented as beautiful that in reality are not. Mm -hmm. And why are they not beautiful? Again, you think about a sunset. What is beautiful about a sunset? Well, it, it makes everyone stop for a moment and realize that there's something beyond what we have here, you know? And so when something is beautiful, it kind of shakes you a little bit and it makes you realize that it's not just about you. 
And so I think that formation and beauty and what you might call taste making, having good taste, used to be something that people tried to do. You know, so that that is something that we need to focus on more. Mm. I just got a text from a friend of the show, Jesus Robles, who uh, is uh, uh, upset because I've left off the list of the most beautiful churches, uh, a church in his hometown in Mexico, the hometown of Zamora in Michoacan, the Santurio of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is an epic and beautiful church. Um, let me ask you real quick, because we're down to seconds here before we go to break. Uh, what would you consider the most beautiful church in the world? Most beautiful church in the world. I'm going to go with St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Really? I love the Gothic architecture and especially how striking it is against the glass office buildings around it. <laughs> Back in 89, I was in Europe mm -hmm. and my dad and I were, were playing tr uh, tourists there. Um, and we traveled to Austria, Switzerland, Italy, Bavaria. And it was interesting because I wasn't Catholic. My dad's still not Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, but guess where all the churches we stopped at? All Catholic churches. All Catholic churches. We didn't visit one single Protestant church, as far as I remember. Yeah. And uh, and I, I just, it was obvious, although we weren't really going to church, it was obvious that this was epic. It was mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was intriguing. And I can still rem I can still see St. Mark's Dome in Venice yeah. right now in my mind, how massive it is. And you can see it from far off and it just draws you in. I'll never forget 2005 as a Catholic visiting St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and just seeing, beholding in the St. Peter's Square, yeah. its facade or yeah. the 10 foot tall letters that wrap the inside yeah. of it, the, the, the holy water stoop as Adrian has uh, schooled us on, the holy water stoops that are as big as I am. I mean, there's something to this, but you talk about a new contemporary Catholic church architecture. What do you mean by that? I mean that there is, there's been a movement, and it's a growing movement. It's continuing to reclaim tradition, and not so that you, you create kind of an antiquarian thing where you're just copying the past, but you're returning to solid foundation from which to kind of begin again. And so what we're seeing in a, in a lot of church design now, and, and thankfully it seems to be widespread, is a desire to have churches that are sacred again, because mm -hmm. I think that's been one of the big problems. We've lost the sense of the sacred. And how do we do that? We do that by returning to the solid foundation of tradition. We have such a beautiful, like you said, go to Europe, such a beautiful and wide variety of beautiful churches in the Catholic Church. Why are we having to reinvent ourselves here? Let's draw on this well, this beautiful font that we have that is the patrimony of the Catholic Church. Mm. That's so true. You know, there, there is a, a movement that I'm aware of, of people reconverting these churches that were, uh, we lovingly call them recovated. Yes. Like after, after the council to kind of uh, refocus them in a way towards the community. But there's mm -hmm. a movement of people uh, restoring these churches and there's Absolutely. wonderful images of before and after. Yeah. What goes into that? Is, is it, is it really difficult? Uh, is it costly? Have you ever done anything like that? So a lot of times it's, it's first, you know, if it, to return to sacred space again, it's realizing first why you build a church in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So you, the reason that church exists is for the altar. The altar of course is the center of the liturgy. It is upon which the, the saving act of Christ is performed in the Mass. And so when you realize that, and you realize that then the church has to be ordered around the altar as a central piece, then you begin to think about, okay, so in these churches that were recovated, how do we now put it back so that all of our attention, our focus, and the whole church is pointed towards what the Mass is about, you know? As far as, you know, is it expensive, is it not? Of course, I mean, a lot of that depends on materials, but mm -hmm. it can be done in a way that is affordable, in a way that, that is prudent, and, and you know, you, you're good stewards of the church's money, but beauty is an essential thing. I think we yeah. forgot that. You know, we, we thought that beauty was optional, but what we've come to realize now is that in order to fully participate in the liturgy, we need to be in a beautiful church. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that's so, so true. I'm thinking of the, when I was in Poland, I did, took a trip to Poland, and in the areas the communists forced 
the people to have brutalist architecture. And then afterwards, immediately afterwards, everyone, everyone's living under communist rule, yeah. but the people living in the brutalist apartments mm-hmm. all started committing suicide at a much Absolutely. higher rate. Yeah. And so they're noticing this, like you're, like you said, we need beauty That's yeah. a need. It's not a want, it's a, it's necessary for Absolutely. us. And I was telling you off air, the, the TFP, people who listen to know, I mention them quite often, uh, big fans and the, the, their founder, Professor Plinio would have these transcendency exercises is what they called it. And I liked how you talked about training us to to like to love beauty, to understand mm-hmm. what beauty is. Yeah. And so they would show images of ugly churches or ugly architecture, ugly cars, things like that, and say, okay, why is this ugly? And then they look at very beautiful cars, beautiful architecture, beautiful paintings, and say, yeah. okay, why is this beautiful? And then when they're out in public and they see ugly statues and things like that, they point it out and say, that's ugly. And if they have time to explain why is that ugly? Because Professor Plinio said, whatever is not explicitly rejected is implicitly accepted. And I find that very interesting how we have this necessity for beauty, even beyond the church, but just in everything, our apartments, our government buildings, our office buildings. Can you speak about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, it's, yeah, beauty is essential. I mean, I want to say a a little bit more about how you can form yourself and your family to, to beauty. So the first thing is, that nature is the first place we encounter beauty in a powerful way, right? I mean, that is, no one's going to beat the creation of God, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if anything, as an architect, you just kind of try to, you know, to be in, in, uh, in connection with nature. So that's one thing. Go camping, go see beautiful things that are natural. The other thing is that I think is really important is be thoughtful about the art you put in your own home, right? Mm-hmm. So think about how the art you're hanging on your walls is going to influence yourself and your family. So be thoughtful about that. And the last thing is go on pilgrimages, you know, go seek out beautiful buildings, beautiful churches, especially, Mm -hmm. and just experience it. You know, like a lot of times people ask me, you know, how do you become a better designer of architecture? And what do you do to kind of form yourself? And I always say, I go visit beautiful churches because at the end of the day, architecture is experienced. You can look at pictures and get an idea, but there's nothing like being in the space. So that's something you can do to kind of form yourself in beauty. Yeah, I, I've been blessed to travel and see uh, various uh, churches all over the world, uh, not so much in Asia, but in other parts. And uh, you, you can always know the ones that inspire you and the ones that don't. I don't think you have to be an architect or have uh, in trained in theology or philosophy to just realize the inherent beauty of these structures. Yeah. Um, but let, talk to me about materials here. Um, do you have a preference in your new contemporary Catholic church architecture philosophy? Do you have a preference on the kinds of materials that ought to be used to construct churches? Sure. I think it's very important to use natural materials as much as possible. So again, you know, to use stone, to use wood, Yes, brick is good as well. So materials that remind us of nature, that remind us of God's creation, because what, what we have to realize is what's happening in a church is we are, in a, in a sense, when you use stone in a building, mm-hmm. you're sanctifying stone. You're offering it up, right? So, you know, there's, of course, the, the concept of sacrifice, right? You're sacrificing the stone for a greater purpose. So you think about the flowers on an altar. The flowers, which are beautiful on their own, but when they're sacrificed, so they adorn an altar, they almost reach their higher purpose, you know? And so the more that we can have these, this idea that a church is really a prefigurement of the heavenly Jerusalem, mm-hmm. right? It's a prefigurement of heaven. Therefore, we are to take, just like we will be elevated, you know, through the grace of God to, to be with him. So all of creation is elevated and a church is a prefigurement of that. Mm. What so, a- Okay, go ahead. I was going to say, so the use of natural materials Mm -hmm. is what communicates that to us. It's a visible form of what I just said. What about the shape of the building? Uh, I was uh, just recalling a second ago as you were talking about uh, Father Jackson's Nothing Superfluous. Mm-hmm. And he's got a whole section on there about yeah. the, the symbolism, the meaning behind Absolutely. the shape of the building and all of the, uh, the elements, uh, the cruciform uh, uh, shape of the building. Do you, do you think we should retain the cruciform? Or do you think it's okay to have round or odd-shaped buildings? I, I think, you know, all things being equal, a, a basilica or cruciform shape uh, church is preferable. I mean, I think that that shape of a building is more consonant with the liturgy, right? So if you think about, again, the idea of what's happening, right? So when you enter a church, especially some of these medieval churches, it's great, 
So the narthex is normally very dark, right? Mm -hmm. Because the narthex is representative of the darkness of sin, right? Before you're baptized. Then through the waters of baptism, you enter into the church and, and, you know, you open the doors and it's flooded with light. So now you're part of the body of Christ, right? And the body of Christ is facing eastward, normally in a traditional church, to where the altar is. What is the altar? The altar is the meeting of heaven and earth. And so the church building itself was a, a testament to the journey of the Christian. So when you have a linear plan or a cruciform plan, that is built into the architecture. You know, mm-hmm. it's not something you just have to imagine. You see it. Mm-hmm. And then when you add on to that, just the, the beauty of the decorations, the, the, uh, the stations of the cross, all of the statuary that you have in a church, all of that begins to build in your mind an idea of what heaven's like. Mm. And that's necessary. That's really important. What would you say is the ugliest church in the world? You said St. Peter, St. Patrick's in New York was the most beautiful. What's the ugliest? The ugliest church in the world. You know, I try not to think about ugly churches. <laughs> <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> our, uh, our friend Nancy over on YouTube said the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City looks like a circus tent. Yep. Yes. To that's me, it reminds very, me of the UN crime. Hall. Yeah, it's very unfortunate yeah, because, of course, that is one of the, the most important pilgrimage sites in the world. Mm-hmm. But the architecture is very unfortunate there. <laughs> and there's the older church right across the square. That's right. Which is more beautiful. It is. But yeah. we don't go there anymore, apparently. Yeah. yeah. So you don't, uh, the ugliest church in the world, you don't have a... You don't I'm have thinking a uh, it's probably some sort of brutalist church. I mean, I actually think Our Lady of the Angels in California, the, the LA <laughs> Cathedral, is one of, yeah. the, one of the ugliest. And in fact, you know, little quick fact on that. So the architect, um, Rafael Moneo, was the architect, not to throw him under the bus, but um, he... Uh, he, I think, was confused. I was reading about his design of the church, and he said, we oriented the church towards Rome. And I was like, well, that's not really a thing. <laughs> I mean, so Every direction. So it, it almost made me think that he didn't really know much about Catholicism. But, but speaking of orientation of a church, and you know, I mentioned East. So that used to be, across the board, the way Christians built churches was facing East. And why East? Because East is the rising of the sun, which is symbolic of the resurrection. And so yeah. again, in the architecture itself, imagine going to mass in the morning, mm-hmm. having a stained glass window on that east wall, mm-hmm. and then watching the sun rise mm-hmm. and that light just beaming Flooding in, in yeah. right? So again, we kind of moved away from that, but there's a real significance to mm-hmm. facing a church east. Yeah, we built our home chapel facing east for that yeah. very reason. Yeah, We just don't have the stained glass. Right. Yet. Yet. Well, Yet. Real, real quickly, we only have about like 30 <laughs> seconds left in a conversation, but what would you say to someone who's like, I get what you're saying, but, you know, I like my church. I may not have all this stuff, but I like it. I would say that we need to take a broad perspective and, again, reflect on what does the liturgy demand? You know, like if you think about it's, you know, we are educating whether we realize it or not. We are being formed by the buildings we design and build. And so if we are not thoughtful about it, and if we don't design them in such a way that it reinforces the liturgy, then, you know, at the least we are, we are kind of like missing a huge opportunity, but we need to really take advantage of it because architecture is a powerful thing mm-hmm. that can't be forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, uh, this church is ugly. Jesus Robles is chiming in with, I asked the ugliest and the most beautiful, all Jesus said was, St. Basil's. Yes, same, <laughs> same Basil's. Is and, it uh, the most beautiful Jesus? Is it the least beautiful? I mean, ooh, no. I, I got a runner up. I have a friend who got mm-hmm. married at St. Basil's Chapel in Houston. And he was like, yeah, at the time, it was great <laughs> because, you know, we went to school there, went to church there while we were at school, and we met at there. And so it was like, Super nice for that reason, but looking back, I wish we hadn't gotten married there. I was like, yep, <laughs> yeah. I was like, yep, yep, dude. That's it's kind of it's kind of horrendous. They the Philip Johnson when he created it, he did not want the only things that could be called beautiful in that church, which he did not want the uh, crucifix the corpus there. He wanted the 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 crucifix to be just negative space, yeah. and so they had to force him to put a corpus. And he did not want the Our Lady Seat of Wisdom there, mm. which it's not even a nice statue anyway. It's like he looks like our Lord looks like Homer Simpson. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to be able to unsee that now. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. And, and, and so and 
he did not input a confessional in there because he forgot because he didn't know that oh. we needed one. And so that was added later, in which you that can tell. That makes sense. You can because tell. Because it's like. It's in the corner, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, not only yeah. is it in the corner, but like. It sticks out. It sticks out. It, oh, sticks, no. it juts out. Oh, right. And, yep. Not, yeah. Does not belong. Does <laughs> oh, not belong. Oh, no. Wow. I, okay. I got, I got actually, I'm going to take it back. Japan okay. does not have the worst church. Uh -oh. <laughs> no. Uh -oh. It's the Who new knows? Camaldoni Hermitage in Big Sur. And Adrian, I'm going to put this in the chat okay. if you want to. I'll put it up. Big Sur? That's tragic. It's egregious. I, I would say also a contender for maybe the most ugliest is this ecumenical compound being built in the Middle East. Oh, oh yeah. Yikes. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it yet. So you haven't seen it the design right. pictures? No. Design? Yikes. If I would say uh, Notre Dame mm -hmm. is going to be the ugliest church if it ends up being the way it is, Ugh. the way they're, they sent it the designs, the ecological church. Oh, this church, so this church is in Big Sur, you say? Oh, man, it's horrible. There's, the Rothko looks worse than man, this. Man, there's the, the chapel <laughs> at the University of Notre Dame, uh, University of Dallas, looks Ooh, similar yeah. to this. <laughs> That's no, not a good no, one. Nope. No. So I'm looking through a gallery of the images they put up, and it's like, you know, obviously this is egregious, pretty bad. Mm -hmm. It looks like I a got yurt. it on my desktop there, uh... Uh, Adrian, you would like to show okay. to him, yeah. And then among the gallery, there's a picture of a Tibetan prayer bowl, and it Ooh. says, yeah. the bowl that's rang after meditation. Yeah. Like, oh, come on. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a retreat facility that looks a lot like this as well here locally. It just cringe. There's another parish that's built like this where everybody's surrounding in this circle of... Uh, of happiness, joy, and euphoric uh, yeah. hand-holding. Uh, places like this make my mind uh, spin. Like, it's just it's just so bizarre to me. Here, I'm so gonna bizarre. I'm gonna show you guys the Rothko Chapel. Oh yes. If you've never seen the Rothko Chapel, it is it is peak ugly. Yeah. Peak ugly. The peak ugly. It is mm -hmm. impressive. I would describe it as oppressive. Oppressive, yeah. <laughs> oppressive. That's exactly right. You, will peak you, go in, you, you should go in just, just to feel Especially feel during sad. Lent, possibly. You right. Get some extra yeah. grace it was a whole it. thing where they had Whoa. this, like, they spent like a ton of money recently, very recently, yep. to redesign yep. some things because uh -huh. they were saying that the sunlight coming through the roof was damaging the art and i was like it's just <laughs> black how can you tell <laughs> exactly i was like what are you saying where's the oh, downside man. is this the next is question a, <laughs> this is a perfect opportunity for an art restorer to go in and be yeah. like i'm a professional i care so much about the rothko chapel can i come in and restore and yeah. just go to home yes. depot pick up some black paint <laughs> never, they'll never know the difference, they, yeah, they know the difference. <laughs> uh, i just so got bad. fact checked by sci-fi mike over on odyssey Okay. Uh, whew, wow. What do you work for? Facebook sci-fi? He says the Cinderella shoe in Thailand uh, is not actually a, a church. He says it has no religious function. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Alatia is the one who called it a church, not me. Oh, just, just yeah. so you know. Alatia. Yeah. Alatia. Solid Catholic resource there. Alatia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, praise be to God. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's horrendous. Uh, it, it, it is mind boggling to go into these places and just wonder how who approved, who signed off on the millions of dollars to build that stuff and thought that it was going to be okay. good. So that's my biggest thing. And I want to get your take on this. The So I hear all the time whenever I bring up beautiful church architecture, people are like, well, you can't be expecting that from people. That's it, it costs so much to make a beautiful uh, Gothic cathedral mm -hmm. and this that, and the other. And they don't only have so much money, so we end up getting what we have. And so, is that a good argument? Why is that flawed? Tell me what what's up with this. That's a terrible argument. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I think what people don't realize, you know, we live in what I call a microwave society. You know, we expect everything to be done in 30 seconds. Convenience. What you, real what you realize when you study history is that these cathedrals, these churches, I mean, they took like 300 years to build. Yeah. I mean, just think about that for a moment. I mean, our country is about that old. So imagine <laughs> working on one building for that long. So, I mean, I think we need to regain patience as Catholics when it comes to our buildings and realize that, we're going to build incrementally. The yeah. church is not going to be finished the first day. It's yeah. a generational project yeah. that each generation contributes and adds to the church. And yes, in 300 years, it's going to look like the ones in Europe. You know, mm. the church that my wife and I were married in is the Cathedral of Manchester, New Hampshire. That church is, was built by the parishioners. So they worked in the mills. And at yeah. the time, those mills were the largest mill on the planet. Yeah. And uh, so they would do their shift. They, before they went home to have dinner, 
they do a shift building the cathedral. Yeah. Um, so those days are gone. You can't, not only can you not, but you'd have to, yeah, bonded con- contractors, right, yeah. bonded Liability, insurance, lawyers. liabilities. I mean, there's no more, gone is the day where the parishioners come to build their yeah. church. I'm thinking of the painted churches, uh, just mm-hmm. not that far down the road from us here. They were migrant communities yeah. who built these churches. They didn't have millions of dollars well, to or a degree. extravagant materials. Right. They did the best they can, and they're beautiful. They're beautiful. To a degree, I would disagree, Joe, though, because, like, for instance, the... The cathedral, I mean, not the cathedral, the church in Chicago, the Institute of Christ the King Church that got burned down Mm -hmm. and that they just got booted from uh, or not booted from, but their faculties were taken away. Mm -hmm. Emily Alcaraz, our former uh, co employee, Mm -hmm. co employer, what employee? There you go, I can't speak. Uh, Emily, her dad helped build the the altar rail there, and some other prisoners helped build the altar there. And the but different the, parishioners are but I'm talking like, about the building structure, right? Right, but I mean, there's a, to a degree. Mall. That's why I'm saying I disagree to a, a degree. Well, well, like I mean, you can still contribute to the church with our with mm-hmm. our own hands. Yeah, very true. Yeah, that's true. Very true. So, uh, two things to say about that. One of my favorite things about you know just churches in the city. So, Holy Rosary in Midtown. You know, it's a Gothic building built in the 30s. About so I I did a renovation for their sacristy, and I was looking at the original drawings from the 30s, and there was a note at the bottom. That said, whenever possible, use parish men for construction. Wow. And I, I love that. I was like, yeah, we need to do this again, you know? I mean, yes, liability and everything else. But yeah, the other one is, Adrian, you're right. I mean, there's still an opportunity, let's say, with woodwork, with painting, with the sacred arts, where people can mm. still get involved, you know? Yeah. Because again, maybe at the beginning, you don't have it all be- beautified yet. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, a, it's a process over time that you work on. Let me ask you, I mean, this is going to seem maybe somewhat controversial anyway. Pesky Jesuits in the house. Hey, praise be to God. <laughs> I haven't seen Pesky in a while. How are you doing, my friend? Good to see Those you. Those darn Jesuits. St. Killebug. Oh, yeah. one, more, one more thought before yeah. you, you ask that. Yeah. So regarding, you know, why can't we do these beautiful churches anymore? Here's what I, I don't get. Sometimes, like, you know, you travel. Like one time I went to this one town. I don't know if you say Jarrell or Gerald, Texas, but it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. Yeah. Farming community. Mm-hmm. Driving up. Mm-hmm. I drive up. Beautiful church, gothic, two towers in the what? surrounded by cornfields. Yeah, and I, and I was yeah. like, "How is it possible that these people yeah. have this gorgeous church, but in Houston, Texas, where can't we have so much money, we can't get it done?" Yeah. So the thing is, we're the most, we're the richest country in the world. Yeah. We have more money than I think anyone in human history. Mm-hmm. Why can't we build beautiful churches? Because we don't want you know? to. Because we don't want to. That's right. We yeah. don't prioritize yeah. them. Yeah. Mother Angelica's Shrine in Hansville. Ever been there? Yeah. Beautiful. You, 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 middle of nowhere. Right. Epic, <laughs> epic drive, scenic drive with a white picket fence on both sides. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it opens up to, oh, this yes. Italian How'd monastery. I'm sorry? How did that go? Oh. Wow. <laughs> uh, wow. It's, it's epic. It's beautiful. The sky it's opened it's and... and yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> the thing is, it's possible. And then, yeah, we just have to yeah. decide to do it. Yeah. That's a great point because, you know, they, these ugly churches that we build are not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> that's no, they're that's not. what gets they're me. Not that's cheap. what gets me. We're like, yeah. it's like, money. yeah, we're spending equal amounts of money, if yes. not more, yes. and we're getting these ugly churches. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, uh, good morning to you, Eva Wigley. Thanks for joining us today on uh, Facebook. Praise be to God. Good to see you there. So, all right. Uh, here's kind of a bit more controversial, but I think it's I, I'm fascinating to get your opinion. Of course, last week, uh, His Holiness Pope Francis went to Canada to mm-hmm. uh, uh, to deal with the indigenous uh, outcry, so to speak, there. It was uh, dealt with. We covered that topic quite a bit here uh, on the show last week. But you were born and raised in Mexico, if I'm yes, not mistaken. Yes, that's right. So... All right. Um, most of the beautiful churches in your home country of Mexico mm-hmm. are colony, colonizing yeah. type of architecture. Absolutely. But yet, I think we all agree they're beautiful. They are. They're epic. So mm-hmm. um, you think there's the, an element here where we are trying to, we are just casting or sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater here. We're trying to say all colonizing and all uh, historical colonizing uh, architecture, ideas, thoughts, culture, everything has to go. Mm -hmm. Is that part of this sort of uh, the last five decades of of testing and experimentation? Well, you know, I I kind of chuckle at some of this because if it weren't for colonization, I wouldn't exist. (laughs) I mean, Mexico is a perfect example because the Spanish, you know, it was a blend of the cultures and people married each other and had babies and everything else. I mean, I literally would not exist if it wasn't for colonization, not to mention 
the wonderful culture that is Mexico is a confluence of all, of Spanish and native uh, culture, you know? So, in the same thing with the architecture. Although, of course, the Spanish brought their architecture to Mexico, then Mexico developed its own flavor of it, right? So, what would be the key differences that you could point to? Maybe give us an example. So, in Mexico, the the use of really bright colors, right? I mean, that's kind of something people think about in, in colonial churches, mm. as well as the resourcefulness. I mean, if you think about Mexico, is is a beautiful country with rugged terrain. With sometimes they had to pull from from the local materials that they had. So you have volcanic rock in some of these churches, and so what what you found is that. As the, this kind of colonial Spanish architecture developed in Mexico, mm-hmm. it developed its own style, its own, its own uh, you know, kind of uh, structure. And it was because of the local materials, but also the local artisans, you know, different expressions began to develop in Mexico. Mm. And what about like the mission style churches? Like what is, what is, like, is, it, is it called a mission style purely because it was built in the missions or like what, what makes something a mission style church? Yeah, so... It, that the name comes from the fact that that kind of style of architecture, which is a very simple but very strong style of architecture, comes from the missionaries, a lot of them Franciscan, who set up missions all over California and Texas and, and other parts of the United States. So, yeah, that's that's where that style kind of gets cemented. Like, is that Spanish or is it just like universal? It's a Spanish style okay. mainly. Yeah, because mm. I know the the church that Joe goes to, Regina and Chaley, they're actually planning on. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're planning on building their church in mission style. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of just like, I um, I went to go visit in El Paso some of the old churches there. I think they have like the oldest mission. Yeah, uh, and they and my thing is, I think they're beautiful, but it's not my taste. Sure. Um, and I'm just thinking, why? Like, it just it seems maybe too simple, which I understand for like a mission. Um, but if you're like established, then I'm like, why would you want to build a mission style church sure. if you're like established? Like, No, that's a good question. I, I don't know. It, it was, I mean, mission parishes were almost, if you, I mean, you think about it, almost emergency parishes, right? Like there were uh, fortifications yeah. a lot mm-hmm. of times, right? Mm-hmm. Think of yeah. the Alamo, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they, they were meant to almost be stronger and more simple Mm. With the idea that a city will develop over time and then one day you'll build the actual church. Mm. So I don't think they were meant to be as kind of the permanent church that you would go to all the time. Mm. See, I'm glad you said that. Makes me more, <laughs> it makes me happier that I have that opinion. <laughs> and, and you also have to remember the, the main purpose of a mission was for monastic purposes, not for a parish church. Mm. Yeah. You, there is a difference, you know, that you would. Yeah. You would build. I, it also included farmland and, mm. and, that's right. and mm-hmm. animal husbandry and all mm-hmm. of that, all that kind of Cemetery. stuff. Cemetery. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, that's one of the unique parts about the, the missions here in the United States, uh, especially uh, St. Hanipero Serra, he lobbied the governor in Mexico City to get the conquistadors, to get the Spanish army removed mm-hmm. from the missions because they were they were uh, getting drunk and they were being abusive to the native peoples. Yeah. And he said, they said, but you, you might be killed. And he's like, I'll take the risk. Yeah. It's better. Yeah. And so he had their garrison moved away and they would teach them farming and they would teach them animal husbandry and they would teach them craftsman skills. And of course, along with that came catechism and yeah. baptism and confirmation, marriage and etc. So uh, fascinating, uh, you know, sort of lost art of mm-hmm. missioning people yeah. to the point to, of salvation being the, the point of that. Uh, let's go to the Holy Land. We have a few minutes left in our conversation with Raphael here. So let's go to the Holy Land. Have you been to the Holy Land? I haven't. Uh, you know, Adrian's been there. And I've talked to another architect about this. And he said uh, when he went to the Holy Land, he did not find them at all impressive. Hmm. Like the, the, the big epic churches, they're impressive. They are Large and epic in that sense, they are impressive. Kind of yeah. like, kind of like the cathedral in Houston. The Co Cathedral in Houston, I think, is very ugly, but it's grand. So, but at least mm-hmm. it has gravitas. So there's like right. it does. an element a big of bell beauty. tower too. Yeah, so big bell tower. It has right. an element. The statues are grandiose. So in that sense, there's an element of beauty. But the churches in the Holy Land, what I noticed was they're all fairly ugly, and I think that's because all the original churches were destroyed by the Muslims. And they've been built and rebuilt over and over and over again. So there are some beautiful churches. There are a lot of beautiful chapels yeah. that, that just survived. But a lot of the churches that you go to the Holy Land, you're thinking, oh, these churches are ancient churches. Yeah. And it's like these churches have all been built in the last like 100 years or so. Yeah. And so it just has the same element that you see everywhere else in the world. Mm. And I mentioned off air earlier, the Church of the Annunciation in, in the Holy Land is absolutely horrendous. Mm. And the and they even have the, the upper church 
where all the countries were asked to send in an image of Our Lady, which I was like, that's a very beautiful sentiment. Like, yeah. you'd see Our Lady, uh, Mexico sending Our Lady Guadalupe, France sending Our Lady Lords. No, they didn't do that. They instead, they all sent their, like, their own fabricated uh, versions of Our Lady that they just invented. And so they have Our Lady of America, and it's uh, a like made out of like steel because it was given over during like sometime around the... Um, industrial era yeah. and so uh, the people uh, the person giving us a tour guy was like yeah we call this one our lady the tinfoil and it's like this is exactly <laughs> what we're getting yeah uh Lou's, let me uh, oh i'm sorry ahead. real quick Lou's on our uh, telegram group our private cdt insider telegram group has been sending posting pictures of some beautiful oh, wow. churches in mexico uh you know uh and jesus sent me a beautiful picture earlier as well uh, uh this looks like uh Looks like Tammy here also came across a beautiful church uh, as well. So some epic places. Oh, yeah, Lourdes, Our Lady of Lourdes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the yeah. just the outside alone is worth the price of admission. What Absolutely. were you going to say, Rudy? Uh, I was going to ask you, what's your favorite style of of church uh, architecture, and why is it Rococo? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't like Rococo. Dude, Rococo's Rococo is intense. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes not. He's the best. He's <laughs> so, the best. I mean, to be honest, I think Gothic architecture Gothic. for me takes yeah. it just because it, you know, the it's it's the style that, first of all, I mean, so vertical, right? It, mm. It's all about drawing your eyes up to heaven, um, as well as I feel like it's the style that really weaves nature into the design. So if you think mm. about all of the decoration in a Gothic church, it's normally flowers and plants you know and and so it's like it's reminiscent of that of, of the garden of eden you know and, oh, and the garden okay. of eden restored so um yeah so gothic architecture for me it's it's beautiful this all that stained glass you know the fact that they have so much of it it's such a part of the design mm. you're almost as an architect designing with light itself as a material you know yeah. and that to me is is super fun can nature go too far though the sagrada familia in barcelona <laughs> it might be on this this yeah. this hit list here the termite mound that's yeah. <laughs> that's a controversial one for sure i think people have divided opinions because it is yeah it's all over the place well you know what's interesting about gaudi so gaudi antony gaudi who's the the architect of sagrada familia catalan architect so he was a devout catholic right so he yeah is an example and i think in fact his his cause for canonization might be wasn't uh, he hit by a car yes he died hit by a trolley yeah yes. hit by a trolley yeah, yeah it's trolley not a good problem. way to go <laughs> no it's, i don't recommend it yeah. yeah but so devout catholic you know i i think that the design of sagrada familia comes from a place of prayer mm. but you know what i think he was influenced at the time when he, when sagrada familia was being designed dioramas were really popular and i, oh, I don't know if you if you know this but like back in the day for entertainment, because they didn't have movies and things, they would build these big dioramas, you know, of different things, of Paris or, or so on. Mm. And people would go see them, right? And so you would pop in and see this diorama of Paris. Well, Gaudi takes that, and if you look at the facade of Sagrada Familia... I got it on my desktop here. I'm you looking see at a video of it. that it's kind of like a diorama, right? Of, mm. of, That's um, funny you and, mentioned that. And each facade is a different, you know, a different part of, of the gospel, right? Yeah, one of the missions in California, uh, again, Spanish ar architecture, they have a massive diorama of the uh, nativity of our blessed Lord. Mm. And uh, it, you're right, it was a thing that they were interested it in. Was a, it's a thing <laughs> they were definitely interested in. So, I mean, I will say what that building... And I will say, I have not been there, and so it's hard to judge just, be, you know, based on pictures, but yeah. the quality of light of the space seems tremendous. The other thing that I'll give Gaudi credit for is that he was, the, the plan of the church is cruciform, so he was uh, rooted in that tradition, but was yet innovating, right? So some of the geometry that he's working with and some of the columns, the way they turn and twist, yeah. it's from a purely kind of a architectural point of view and from technology point of view, mm -hmm. it's remarkable. What wow. about the specifics of church buildings? Like I was, uh, I mentioned to Luis about the St. Charles Borromeo, how he mm -hmm. created a manual of yeah. like how can churches be built? And I'm, I was reading it and I was like, wow, like this is yeah. like incredible. He's like, it has to be this many feet from the, the altar, from the back wall and it has to be this many feet and he was like you the can do the pew has to see 10 he's like, families no pews allowed no i'm just kidding he didn't say that but uh <laughs> in the, um but yeah, I mean, there he was basically, he said, hey, you can build any kind of Catholic architecture. It could be Gothic, it could be Romanesque, yeah. Yeah. it could be any of these things. But these are the things that are very, very important that you cannot stray from. Yeah. Have you ever read Ch Charles Borromeo's uh, uh, instructions on that? And what do you think about like the specificity of it? 
I have. I have read it. I mean, I'll tell you, I think that the specificity of those kinds of instructions, because there's several books that are kind of like that. We need that right now. <laughs> because I think you could argue that for a time, it was just in the air, if you will. Like everybody knew what a church looked like. And, and so you could go to any architect and they could put it together for you. But in today's age, we need to return to that kind of specificity because unfortunately there, there's not enough architects who do know what, what a church looks like, you know? So I think it's very useful. Um, and, you know, and it's useful as a starting point. You can obviously finesse and move things around as needed for, for maybe the, the place where you're building, you know? But, but no, it's a very helpful and useful thing to be specific. And, you know, St. Charles Borromeo was writing kind of at the time of the Reformation. So there was upheaval about what a church was like. And, you know, the Protestants were wanting to rip out things. And he was saying, no, 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 we need to do it this way, mm -hmm. not only to preserve our, our Catholic faith, but also to reinforce it, to teach it mm -hmm. in a new and better way. So, no, it's super important. Do you find the restraints to be freeing? Absolutely. And I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine about this, that unfortunately what happened as part of the modernist movement is there's this need to reinvent the whole world every time you design something, right? So, like, mm -hmm. I need to decide where the altar goes. I need to decide where the baptismal font goes. So there's, like, you spend so much time reinventing the whole thing instead of knowing where things are supposed to go and being creative in how you express those things, you know? Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's much more freeing to just rely on that tradition instead of trying to reinvent the world every time you design a church. Yeah, wow. I'm um, just looking at more of this video from this uh, church in Barcelona. It's absolutely, it's just like, there's so many things. You have to just take yeah. it all in. And just, <laughs> it's so epic in size and space. But I got to say, I am i don't think I absolutely love this particular design. I like it. Design. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm a. I'm partial to St. Peter's. That's yeah. It's 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 St. John and, and hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, I've never been to Ma Mary Major. Next time I go to Rome, I'm definitely going to check out St. Mary Major. But God yeah. bless you, Raphael. Thank you for your time today. We Thank really you. enjoyed our this conversation with you. Be sure, dear listener, to uh, check out his podcast, uh, which is the uh, Be a Beauty Ever New. Beauty Ever New. I'll put a link to it in the CDT Insider email, which I'll send this afternoon. Have a great weekend, whatever epic thing and adventure you're going to be on. We'll see you back here on Monday morning. Until then, God bless you.